Welcome everyone to another episode of Science Planets and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth, uh, shamanic astrologer. I'm here to go over the uh, next uh, seg uh, segment of March, the last half of March, and then into early April. And there are a lot of different things happening there. And I want to really get into some of the, make you aware of some of these um, important dates and especially around the equinox and the, uh, the movement of the planets into uh, several uh, few of them into a couple of different signs. So before I go do that, I just wanna say it's, it's been about close to a month, maybe a little over a month since I recorded the last update and there've been uh, you know, just tremendous amount of uh, work and uh, back and forth of uh, my schedule of uh, coming together and, and being able to, to create this uh, next video uh, for you all. So I'm happy to, to be in this space and be able to do that at this time. And um, you know, looking forward to uh, what's upcoming in the rest of this month of March, 2021. And uh, so uh, this has been recorded. The date is uh, March 15th, 2021. And we're just about a week away from, less than a week away from the actual equinox uh, spring up here in the Northern Hemisphere and um, fall down in the Southern Hemisphere. So without further ado, let me go ahead and proceed forward here. Okay, as outlined below, this is the 16th uh, regular episode of Science, Plants, and Stellar Rhythms, and this will be about uh, equinox and initiative, and specifically around the sign of Aries. There's a lot of activity in that sign and how the equinox is um, associated with that sign. There's a lot that several slides I'm going to talk about with that, and um, the Sun and Venus and Mercury um, and other parts, Chiron, uh, all in the sign of Aries. There's also Eris, which is in Aries too, and I've talked about it in previous uh, videos, and there will be more about Eris in the future, especially as it aligns with Pluto um, uh, later this year in a square. So as we move into the 16th episode, this is gonna highlight the rest of March, uh, second half of March, 2021 into early April. And just to, at this moment, take a pause, acknowledge and invoke stars, the planets, to our relations and creation, and being a part of all cosmic creation self, that we are here, that the planets are here, that we have, we are here connected, intimately connected to the relationship with Gaia and uh, the sky above, with all that, all the, all that goes into that space and what we uh, observe, what we experience, uh, what we feel in all of that. So we're here to honor that each and every time in our own lives and in this video as well. All right, so highlights. What we have are equinox. This is, uh, there's two equinoxes every year and uh, we're gonna be talking about the March equinox. Also, Mercury moving into Pisces. So this is a Mercury's been um, spending a lot of time in the sign of Aquarius, and uh, on, as of this recording, this is the day that Mercury moves into the sign of Pisces. Aries, Venus, and Chiron. A lot of activity, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is going on in that. And then, of course, uh, I'm going to be also talking about the return of Pluto. Pluto actually gets to within one degree of the natal chart position of Pluto uh, for in the United States. So July 4th, 1776, Pluto was at a certain position in the sky, and now Pluto has come back to its uh, near its original position. Uh, not exactly, but we are in, we have been in the window of this Pluto return since 2020. And so we're now moving into this next stage of it in this Pluto return. So there's more discussion there happening in this video along with some other highlights I'm gonna mention here in the next slide. Um, this is just an outline of important dates coming up. Uh, and you can, uh, obviously, if you've got your own ephemeris or your own uh, astrological calendar, or you 
you get notifications from some other place. Uh, this is another way you can you can do this, and you know, I say pause the uh, the video to uh, make note of this, or print out the uh, the dates. But beyond the ones that I mentioned, upcoming March sixteenth. Uh, Jupiter is going to be now more than 10 degrees from Saturn. Excuse me. It's it's actually Jupiter spent a lot of time with Saturn in 2020 and into early 2021. Uh, but now it's starting to separate itself more uh, fully. And really, this is the point where it doesn't it doesn't come back within 10 degrees uh, this year uh, when that 10 degree orb uh, with Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn specifically. And so why we use, in part, why we use 10 degrees uh, is when you're looking up in the sky and you see two uh, celestial objects together, it could be a star and a planet or the moon and a planet or a star. And if you extend your arm with a closed fist in that, in the, between the two uh, outside knuckles, uh, that is a roughly a 10 degree, approximately 10 degree orb. So in ancient times, when they would look at the sky, they would see that that, oh, they're now moving into conjunction or one object is moving in conjunction with another object. So that's how these are, these are important um, uh, boundaries, if you will, uh, in astrology and um, you know, in our ancient cultures. Other things to note, um, and I can mention March 24th here, uh, Pluto comes within one degree of the natal Pluto position of the uh, United States uh, astrological chart. We have a full moon in uh, eight degrees Libra on the 28th. We have a Venus Chiron conjunction um, with a Sun Chiron conjunction roughly on the same day uh, at close to nine degrees Aries. Uh, Mercury Neptune conjunction in Pisces. This is uh, this is part of that Piscean wave we've been getting in uh, March. And last week we had a Neptune Sun conjunction, and um, also Venus Neptune conjunction. And so this is we're we're heading towards the territory of uh, you know moving beyond uh, Pisces into more into the Aries uh, energy. But uh, needless to say that uh, I've gotten some testimonies from others of how uh, uh, challenging it might have been in certain respects, but also how opening and um, a sort of spacious, if you will, of a feeling around that. Um, we have such a reliance upon uh, the hard reality that it can be disturbing having a strong, uh, I might say, uh, formlessness in our lives. Um, when, especially when we're having a Neptune uh, Sun conjunction and then added to that Venus transiting through that area. And then of course now later in uh, March, we've got Mercury and Neptune. Then we get into April and we have uh, Mercury speeding through the rest of Pisces into a sign of Aries. Uh, we have a Venus Ceres conjunction, which I'm gonna highlight later. And uh, two moon conjunctions connected in uh, the sign of Aquarius with Saturn and Jupiter, which will be at the end of this uh, video. I'll talk more about that. So starting out, uh, we have Mercury and Pisces between March 15th and April 3rd. This is uh, moving from the uh, Aquarius thinking function, um, consciousness function, to more of the feeling function and utilizing the heart and spirit to great effect. And it, this is Pisces is a uh, mystical and ethereal type of archetype and represents a, a capacity for empathy and compassion and desire to be of service in the world. So it's seen, it's, it's thinking through the heart space, thinking through the spirit space, thinking through that, what can we contribute? What can we give? Well, how can we be of service in the world? And that Mercury transit is all about that. Uh, on March 29th, Mercury conjuncts Neptune, uh, 21 degrees 20 Pisces, expanding the feeling of heart and mystical, uh, mystically centered experiences. So for those that have Pisces, strong Pisces energy, and especially in the 
uh, ladder, uh, the second uh, degree, second part of the house or the, or the sign between say 17 degrees to 29 degrees. This is kind of this area where a lot of this activity is taking place right now and into uh, later this month. Um, and then some people are, might be in a, a full on Neptune cycle with, you know, it could be affecting your, you know, a particular personal point in Virgo or Sagittarius or Gemini. And so this is, this is definitely a sort of a, a major highlight of that transit when you get uh, some of the inner planets clustered in there and uh, a Venus a Sun conjunction as well. All right, so we go on to a Moon Mars conjunction. This is um, this happens every month. Uh, this is going to be the first of two in the sign of Gemini, and in uh, shamanic astrology, there's a you know we how we define uh, and how Daniel Jumaro came up with the Mars synodic cycle or his the shamanic astrology version of it. It starts from Mars Sun opposition to and ends at uh, the next Mars Sun opposition. And then there's a phase in that Mars cycle that is um, called uh, the uh, phase two. It's sort of a, this uh, youthful, adventurous phase of, of challenges, of tasks, of uh, you might say things that need to be uh, done in order to, to, for the masculine to part of ourselves to grow. Um, and, you know, it, at one time it was associated with the labors of Hercules and there are many versions of that. That's just more of a, the one that is more well known. And in even in Native America, uh, the Pawnee called it the 10 hard things, um, which it's like, it's, it's as if the uh, great spirit or, or um, the, uh, uh, you know, creator is sending things for the masculine to accomplish, to uh, obstacle to overcome. Um, and so this is a fourth, quote, hard thing in the conjunction of this phase. Now, um, it, this phase doesn't like it is an exact representation of some of these cultural uh, and spiritual um, uh, uh, beliefs and, and, and their projections, but it does uh, give you an idea of how those things um, uh, came about. Um, this phase will go on until uh, uh, later this summer and when uh, the planet Mars moves into a space where it um, uh, gets into, um, uh, I think it's the, towards the end of summer, I believe it's in September. Again, this is a little farther ahead where it moves into a 15 degree orb with the sun. And so it, in the glare of the sun, it disappears. And so it it gets into the underworld there. But the area that this moon Mars conjunction, coming back to here, this is March 19th in 2021, it's, it's moved into this really powerful, highly visible area of the sky, well-recognized uh, called the sacred Lakota sacred hoop of stars as a, uh, has arguably the greatest collection of, of recognizable and bright stars in the sky, including uh, you know, Aldebaran, Pleiades, uh, Sirius, uh, oh, the stars of Orion, including Betelgeuse um, and Rigel, and then the twins, Pollux and Castor. So all of these are uh, connected strongly. And so when you get these, um, you know, these uh, planets crossing in and the moon coming through, it can make for a, a pretty uh, spectacular viewing uh, for night sky watchers and observers. Uh, Mars represents the masculine principle and Gemini, the dancing trickster. Cere it's a cerebral energy, shape-shifting Peter Pan, Cocopelli archetype. Imagination is, uh, you know, from, from a, uh, I say, uh, a pure sense of what Gemini represents. It's kind of a limitless desire to, to know all, um, even though it, it can't know all, it's, it's, it's continually strives to know. And then the moon's passage through this area with Mars activates this uh, creative storyteller, this brilliant, playful, creative storyteller. So it's, again, this is kind of a, it's interesting that Mars is moving in there. Gemini is a, a androgynous type of, uh, you know, shape-shifting energy. So it doesn't really have a specific like gender persona in, in that way. 
uh, I would I would also call mercury in particular uh, very very much the same one the very same vein as as Gemini. So this could be a stage of the mass the development of the masculine principle into more lighthearted adventurous uh, exploration with um, imagination and uh, you know storytelling um, with a sense of like uh, playing just to play or writing just to write or uh, connecting, socializing just to do that without any specific goals in mind. And it serves spirit through this, through this playful uh, exploration of imagination and eternal youth. Okay, so here is where the moon Mars conjunction is. We can see this is uh, the very uh, various constellations. And uh, we can see that this is here where the hand of Orion comes up in uh, just uh, actually roughly where Betelgeuse is located in the shoulder of Orion. We can see that this is the June solstice point where the sun is at um, the time of summer here in the Northern hemisphere and winter in the South. So this is that, this is that space, but Mars is at nine degrees Gemini here. So it's quite far, although the, the next uh, conjunction with the moon happens much closer to uh, this June solstice point. And we can see it's not far from Pleiades and Aldebaran. So on the 19th, when you're looking up in the evening sky, you'll be able to see this collection of stars, planet, and uh, of course, Earth's moon. Okay, let's take a look at the March equinox. This is the day where there is roughly the same amount of sunlight and uh, a darkness. Um, and it, you know, it all depends on where you live. And, you know, you could be in the shadow of mountains, you could be in a, on a plane near the equator, where it's more visible. And as far as like the actual 12 hour day, 12 hour night, um, you know, it, it, again, it depends on where you are on the earth, but in roughly speaking that day as well, along with the September equinox is that time of the equal day, equal night. Um, it's the halfway point between the two solstices. So we're, we're moving into that halfway space between the December solstice and the June solstice where the light was reborn here in the north. And now we're, the, 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 the sun from our perspective here is setting farther and farther to the north and as well as rising uh, farther and farther in the north. So you have this, uh, this great uh, loop, uh, the farther north you go on, on the globe of, of, of the sun spanning in time. And of course you get into the polar regions and then you have this, this window where uh, it's sunlight all the time for uh, a number of months, uh, depending on the latitude you're at. So again, the sun is migrating north of the Earth's equator, and uh, this is the signals the the uh, uh, the crossing uh, of the equinox uh, of the time of, of spring and uh, in the north and, and fall in the south. Here's from a um, heliocentric perspective, Earth seasons. And I've got the highlighted uh, vernal equinox, which is zero Aries. So Aries is always associated with uh, spring. And it's uh, the astrological uh, longitudinal uh, point uh, where the sun is at it, uh, in the sky. And that marks the uh, zero Aries, not specifically the constellation, but the, but the actual point in the sky and with in relation to, uh, to the earth and its tilt and, and so forth. Um, then the autumnal equinox is opposite that. Uh, that is again, uh, autumn in the north and then uh, spring in the uh, south uh, in September. And we can see also here, um, December and June, this is kind of an, has a bit of an exaggeration in order to be able to share, like you can see that there's a difference between um, how close the sun uh, and earth are in December and how uh, far away they are in uh, June and uh, July as well. Okay, so using the uh, vernal equinox point in our own lives. So this is, uh, there are a lot of different um, cultures that use this as a start of a, of a year. And actually can, it's actually a, well, any, of, any of the solstice points 
uh, the uh, Equinox points can be used to start or end a calendar um, or a, a given year. Uh, the same with in anything in between a solstice and an equinox, which are can be called uh, cross quarters. That means they're kind of this this crossways between the the two uh, seasonal points. And um, so uh, cultures would use some of these points to uh, either start uh, a calendar or, or mark a very special time in their um, uh, you know on their own spiritual uh, beliefs, cultural beliefs and uh, different times when they needed to, to take care of things or celebrate something. So it's honoring this, for, this the equinox is kind of honoring this sort of this birthing energy that comes through. This is uh, spring, especially where, you know, more than 80% of the population of earth live north of the equator. It's this, this renewal energy comes forth. The, the, the flowers start to, to, to bloom. There is a certain, um, uh, you know, energy in the air that is accelerated. There's a, there's a feeling of brightness of like, you know, the, there's more light and you're feeling that, that sort of that eagerness, that acceleration initiative, if you will, to go forth out there in the world. Um, and this is, uh, you know, also connects to our appreciation of the Earth Mother in, uh, you know, sort of regifting us every year of this, uh, this the fullness of, of, of life and our participation in it. Uh, this, you know, these equinox points, these solstice points, you know, this is something that you can uh, talk about for, you know, many hours around uh, what uh, peoples have done in the past to honor these, uh, these points and, and at various times. But we can say that there's a certain transmission, if you will, psychically through us, uh, our experiential uh, relationship with the sky and the earth and the creation of living libraries that were erected at various times, including the, the pyramids, uh, stone circles in uh, Europe and, and elsewhere in the world, uh, my other monuments and temples and uh, cosmic clocks. Um, this, this is really, uh, these are really uh, uh, a powerful um, areas. I've been to one, my, well, actually several, I guess, but one in, uh, in 2019 in Scotland and at the Callanish site, which uh, really was a, a, a very powerful uh, testament to what the ancients, how they connected with, with the sky and the earth and their own relationship with it. And you can really feel that yourself for those that especially are those that are sensitive to this, uh, uh, touching the, the stones and the living memory of, uh, you know, that, that has existed for many thousands of years. Okay, uh, let's look at Aries and initiative. So anytime the sun moves into a spring equinox here in the north, uh, North America, Europe, most of Asia, uh, and uh, the um, uh, Africa, uh, more than half of Africa, you know, you've got this, um, this area that's all about Aries. So uh, this year though, uh, Venus actually moves into the sign of Aries less than two days later. And then Mercury moves into Aries on April 3rd. So this is a time of initiatives of breaking through to sunlight or into the light. Um, Aries as a sign represents instinctual initiative, going all in to something worth devoting to, mission orientation and action. Since 2018, this is a little segue into Chiron, and um, there's been much that's talked about Chiron with me, as well as in the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School and others, um, other astrologers as well, and uh, Chiron's passage into the sign of Aries back in 2018. Uh, this Chiron is a, a planetary body of sorts that orbits between Saturn and Uranus. Um, it's now uh, at, its, at a point in its orbit where it's a, a bit farther away from the sun than uh, on average, and so it spends a lot more time in a sign as it's doing this. So in fact, it's going to be spending time in the sign of Aries until transitioning in 2026 to 2027 to the sign of Taurus. This is also uh, not, not long um, before uh, Chiron moves into a return uh, on the U.S. nail chart itself. So this is uh, you know, also part of the important period 
uh, that the United States is experiencing natally. What does Chiron do? So Chiron and Aries helps humanity by providing us with an opportunity to grieve the wounds from things that have been left unhealed in the Western world's march over the centuries, conquering people, resources, cultures, and economies. I mean, this is really, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the deepest of the deep waters here. And when combined with a pillar of return happening, I mean, we were really uncovering the deep, some of the deepest shadows, at least here in the United States um, and seated by the Western world into here. And uh, all that went into that from slavery to manifest destiny to, to wars, um, and uh, uh, on, you know, uncovering certain resources and pollutions and uh, you know, uh, culture battles, uh, strife. These are things that a lot are associated with the Aries, especially when it comes to like mission and purpose, when it comes to fighting, when it comes to the, the association with conquering. And this is uh, what Chiron moving into Aries is giving us a chance to grieve a chance to heal, a chance to repurpose this um, for something other than what we've done in the past. So on another mission to benefit humanity rather than, rather than something destructive. So uh, one of the gifts of uh, 2020 was, and even before that, um, but 2020 magnified this, is being able to really connect into like allowing us to see and spending time alone and the, the deeper uh, recesses of who we are and uh, what our ancestors, uh, uh, you know, what events came forth for them and how they dealt with it and how we are here, the inheritors of that. And what can we do to heal that process? What can we do to recognize those wounds and, and bring them out into a place of discussion and collaboration to, to in order to heal, in order to grieve? So we have an opportunity, we have a chance to do this in, in a really big way. And in fact, at the end of March, we have a, a venus Chiron conjunction uh, on the, around the same day as the uh, uh, Chiron-Sun uh, conjunction. So, you know, um, this, is, this is really important uh, to, um, to recognize and connect into ourselves and meditate on for our, for our lives. Okay, so there's, a few days later, on March 25th, uh, there is a Venus-Sun conjunction. This is the uh, center of the underworld phase for Venus. Uh, the planet Venus is centered uh, during this time between the Earth and the Sun. So if we're looking at it, uh, if we can see picture Earth orbiting and between us and the Sun is the planet Venus. Not exactly where it's crossing the face of the Sun, but it's off-centered, um, but still you know, between us. Um, this, this is a phase of the underworld uh, that Venus is experiencing right now that started on uh, February 10th when Venus got within 10 degrees of the sun from a geocentric perspective. And that means it's in the glare of the sun. So it's harder to see. And the ancient peoples uh, throughout the world um, looked at this as a, a, a celestial underworld as where a planet is connecting with great mystery. It's, it's going through death and rebirth. And in Venus's case, it's, it's in a process of transitioning from the morning sky or morning star to an evening sky or evening star apparition. So this is something that why, we're wondering why you can't see Venus right now and, and you won't until May 3rd. Um, the Venus synodic cycle was uh, in the way that it's brought forth, there have been other uh, it's, the, the shamanic system, and Daniel recognized that ancient cultures looked at the Venus synodic cycle in this way and brought it into the shamanic astrology mystery school. Uh, and there have been other uh, cl uh, uh, cl uh, collaborations around this with Kaylin Castell and Tammy Brunk's uh, Venus Alchemy series. Um, and uh, Emily Trinkus has her own uh, connection to uh, the, the magic of Venus. And this is, it's really powerful um, emphasis here uh, that, you know, was really birthed by um, and spread and where Venus really had its, in some cultures, its own calendar. So in, 
so we get to really connect into this this magic as this is all happening all around the same time with the equinox and uh, you know what Chiron is doing and that really is um, uh, really is magical here. So Venus in Aries uh, is this is an Amazon uh, a warrior uh, archetype and in in this underworld phase Venus is surrendering to the strong pole to be rebirth in the accelerating growing light of springtime in the time where the feminine principle accepts the desire for renewal of strength, will and purpose, but first to initiate itself into the magic of primal cleansing. So it's a uh, major detoxification taking place and a rebirthing process. And so by May 3rd, when it becomes first visible in the evening sky, you know, this is the archetype Aries, um, you know, going through its Venus will be in a different sign at that time. It will be in, I believe it's Taurus at that point, uh, maybe even into uh, Gemini um, as it, yeah, it'll be, I think in the early degrees of Gemini, but I haven't, that'll be in the next uh, uh, video. Uh, but this is, this is a chance for us to uh, connect and this is part of that, especially uh, the related to the feminine principle and uh, the, the warrior uh, version of that or the mission oriented version of that. Uh, it's sort of taking on something that you believe in and, and, and you know, surrendering into its, um, into its desire for ourselves to know that it can benefit us. And especially uh, when we get into uh, on a soul level, it can be really powerful for, for anybody. Um, and for those that are in a, what we call a Venus return cycle, uh, in shamanic astrology, and that would be a little beyond the scope of this video, but there are people, uh, one fifth of people at any time are in a Venus return cycle, meaning that Venus comes back to its original position, uh, natal position on a person's solar return or birthday. That means it's something that's a, that's a time of, 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 you know, death and rebirth for that person, especially in their relationship to the feminine. This conjunction takes place March 25th, Venus and Sun at five degrees, 50 minutes Aries, less than six degrees from the vernal equinox point. So we move into this. Uh, what is the next thing? Well, we have a, a full moon in Libra, March 28th. And this is in the priestess constellation. This full moon takes place at uh, 11.48 a.m. Pacific, 2.48 p.m. Eastern. But in shamanic astrology and, and shamanism, a full moon in, in the old ways, you know, well, it was full for a three-day period. You know, you when you go outside and you look at the moon, it looks full for about three days. And so, yes, the this is the exact moment here in the middle of the day in uh, on March 28th. But on the 27th and the 29th, it's going to look full as well. So uh, something to connect into for yourself. And where this is happening, it's at, um, uh, you know, eight degrees uh, uh, Libra. And it will take place near the star Parima, uh, which is kind of the, uh, the, the shoulder area of the priestess in the sky. And uh, there are two really other very important stars at this time when you see the, uh, the full moon, and that is Spica uh, and Arcturus. They're both roughly around 24 degrees Libra. And so they, they are always kind of together in the sky. And when you look them in the sky, they're actually fairly far apart. This is just looking at, uh, they, they look fairly close together here. But there's the autumnal or September equinox point here. And Libra is all about, um, uh, you know, there's a certain sense of balance with it and has been associated with the balance of justice. But there's also a very strong component of conscious equal partnership. So the, it's about the personal relationship and connecting into those relationships through, you know, observing and honoring the other uh, and themselves and their own identity. So it's really uh, a time of, of really feeling into that for themselves and especially around uh, the sacred principles or, or, you know, of the priestess itself from, from its ancient lineage. We get that, uh, that sort of that transmission through that uh, part of the sky there, uh, especially with uh, Parima and Spica. Spica is connected to the, um, the grain of the earth 
uh, sort of the priestess holding the grain in its hand and the, the representing the sacred rhythms and patterns of the planet and, uh, you know, uh, deeply associated with, with Mother Earth and, and Gaia. All right, so let's go beyond the, the moon into the Pluto return here. And uh, we're not far from finishing up this, this video, but uh, there, I am going to do a, a specific video spe uh, on the Pluto return and only about that. And I'm going to include a, a bit on Eris as well in there. Uh, just because of the relationship there. So the natal position of Pluto in the U.S. chart is 2733 Capricorn. Uh, Pluto gets to, um, uh, in 2021, 2648. So it gets actually uh, about a uh, quarter of a degree into uh, the one degree orb um, when it gets into its when it stations retrograde at the end of April. Uh, 2020 marks the unofficial start of the Pluto return uh, due to the amplification of the Plutonic initiation beginning in February when um, uh, Pluto got within uh, two and a half degrees in March, April, 2020. And uh, I would say, could even say sa um, uh, January, 2020 when there was the Saturn uh, Pluto conjunction uh, taking place. And then Jupiter came in, uh, really started to, to uh, move into that space in, in, in February and March. And then, of course, uh, in the sign of Capricorn, with uh, Mars coming in, making a quadruple um, a situation there for uh, all of us here on Earth. And that was the March 2020. I mean, uh, redefines the whole March madness and uh, the, you know, with the pandemic and the lockdown and all that was associated with the ramifications that we're still working our way, navigating our way through that. Uh, on March 25th, Pluto arrives within one degree. So because this is an extremely rare cycle, uh, I, I wrote in this actually back a, a few years that 2020, I felt like that would be the start of the, uh, the, the initiation cycle of a Pluto return because of the, because of the Saturn, uh, Jupiter and Mars elements in uh, early 2020. Um, okay, so if we went by two and a half degree measurement, some astrologers might use a larger orb and, and others actually use just the sign. So when Pluto moved into uh, Capricorn, it was back in 2008. And so some were talking about the Pluto return as, as you know, far back as then. Um, but if we do that, then this would go on until about uh, towards the end of 2024 when Pluto ingresses, finally ingresses into the sign of Aquarius. So, uh, which is a roughly about two and a half degrees away from uh, the natal position of Pluto in the U.S. chart. Okay, so what, what is this about? Well, uh, I've got some six bullet points here that kind of really uh, encapsulates it. This is a great composting, what's happening in the United States. There is a, a, a major death rebirth uh, uh, taking place, a collective surrender to our fears. Not that we have to just, you know, surrender and that's the end. No, this is uh, an acceptance. This is uh, an invitation to consciously work with them through the process of surrender. And that's that comes into that acceptance. It could also be likened to a chrysalis stage uh, for the United States. So this, this reformulation, alchemization of a new nation, if you will, uh, a new consciousness emerging here in the United States. Systems and structures are being uh, detoxified. And the reason I say this in, in particular is because it's, we're talking about Capricorn, which represents systems and structures and rules and laws. And um, my, uh, one could even say also justice, uh, teaching, education, you know, uh, creating something from a seed point uh, you know, for the long term. Uh, this is a uh, this could be a deep soulful healing of how we are as a nation and the structures and systems we built. And this is this I like to, especially with when it comes to Pluto, it's kind of a, an energy that is uh, you know can be looked at the primal essence of a storm or you know or of a volcano. It's, it's got that uh, that rawness to it, where it's it's not controllable. 
It just exists and is. It doesn't have any, uh, you know, the purpose is to experience it and, and transform and, and, and come through and navigate through it. So this is again, two, 2008 to 2024, Pluto and Capricorn. Again, I, I, um, I intend to do a uh, full video about Pluto at a later time. All right, so uh, Venus and Ceres, this is just a, uh, another feature of the, the feminine and its connection to the Earth Mother. On April 3rd, Venus and Ceres conjunct at 1614 Aries, 16 degrees, 14 minutes. Venus represents the feminine principle and Ceres, the Earth Mother. This conjunction can creates or places additional emphasis on decisively taking up uh, what causes are worth the effort and time and championing the protection of earth and in particular the feminine as well. Really going all into that space uh, and, and becoming part of it. And it's not limited to any uh, you know, gender or class or caste or a political affiliation. This is, this is uh, universal and it's connected to all of us. All right, so then we have Saturn and Jupiter with moon conjunctions. This is kind of a, 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 a relook, spending just a moment here, really looking at Aquarius. And this, when the moon comes over a certain planets or stars, it can activate that archetypal uh, energy, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, transmissions, it can help us connect to the Aquarian uh, ideals and uh, the leading edge and, and being of experimentation and uh, insight and uh, cosmic overview, expansion of consciousness. Um, Saturn can assist us in facilitating a more practical level of repurposing or repurposing, oh, you might say certain uh, breakthroughs, Aquarian breakthroughs in consciousness and technology. And I found that this is uh, definitely playing a role in uh, how our response to, especially uh, this year, the measured response to the pandemic and the, um, the connection we have to each other and, and what we need to do to navigate our way through it using, uh, using breakthroughs in uh, technology, systems and structures and uh, repurposing it uh, for uh, you know, a higher level of, of desire what we want to do in our lives and, um, and, and especially in the United States, the American Rescue Plan that was passed recently. Uh, there is a portion of this, regardless of the political affiliation, there is a portion of this that is comes from a place of, uh, you know, humanitarianism. And I find that uh, Bill, uh, a combination of Aquarius and Saturn in, um, in a beneficial way. But again, I believe that's just the beginning that we that there is much more that, that to address and connect with, that it only addresses certain things, but there are more, much more out there that um, needs to be addressed in order for us to really um, uh, connect uh, into our deeper uh, uh, level of humanity of who we are. All right, so this is, this is what we've got, or what I've got here for this video. Um, there's a, there's a lot that was shared. It was a, a little extra long, uh, because I, you know, I, it's been a while since I've done one and, uh, my schedule I'm hoping will open up more for me to do more of these and, and do more what I call ever, what are called evergreen videos, meaning that you can watch them. doesn't matter what time of year it is. They're always something that, uh, can be learned from them and, uh, you know, more and more educational videos than that. And I do plan on, and, uh, there's a couple of different uh, platforms that I'm going to be doing online courses. So be stay tuned for that. And I'm looking forward to this. I do do monthly meetups, online meetup. Um, and if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll get notifications about that. Uh, the next one is coming up on March 18th. Um, and so 2021. So feel free to, uh, you know, uh, if you're interested in, in being a part of it, I have a few slots left up left open right now, uh, please do uh, correspond and let me know. I hope you all have uh, you know, a beautiful week ahead and uh, you know, dream well out there. Look up into the sky, it's, it's magic is, is there for all of us. I wish you all well, take care.